I'd like to thank Pastor Ford, first of all, for allowing me the opportunity to preach the word again this morning. God bless you. And I'd like Praise to uh, welcome Dr. Pavarkas here again, uh, midst of us again. I remember you came down there and taught a seminary on, uh, when we were down there on y, uh, y Down in St. Cyr, and I still have uh, the notes that you uh, gave us. Amen. <laughs> so so you, you were one of the, one of the foundation stones of great Bible teachers, and I appreciate that you came to them. Amen. Before we get started, let us pray. Father God, if it is your will, please let me be able to minister your word this morning. And Lord God, in the words of Toby Mack, steal my show. Take me out of it, Lord God, and let you be in the place where I'm supposed to be. This I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. You know, this, God gave me this sermon about, I'd say sometime about a year ago. And it pretty much confirmed it to the day by the Sunday school lesson we had uh, this morning and uh, by a couple of other things concerning this topic that I'm about to speak on today. First of all, let me get my something was wrong, couldn't see it. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Then came Amalek and fought Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us men and go out, under, out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So did Joshua and as, so did as Moses, Joshua. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur on, stayed up, the, up, up his, his hands, the one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And, Moses, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial and a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, that is, the Lord my banner. And he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And from, from John chapter 3. Starting at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, <coughs> eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son unto the world to condemn the world, 
but through the world, through him, might be saved. Our Amen. subjects this morning, lift Jesus up. Amen. Moses was a foreshadow. I saw several things when I was studying this lesson. I saw, first of all, that Moses was a foreshadow of Jesus. <coughs> God said to, uh, to tell Moses that I will raise up a prophet like unto you from among his brethren, and, and he will bring forth my word unto the people, and all those that would not hear his word, God would hold it at the, as, a, as a condemnation against them. The word of God said, Jesus said himself, said that he, all those that will not hear the gospel will be condemned. And that's what he's saying today. If you turn your ear, deaf ear, to the Lord, there is no hope for you. Remember uh, the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man said, Father Abraham, send my brothers, uh, Lazarus up there to, uh, back on the earth and let them know not to come down here to this place of hell where I'm at. And, and Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they will not believe one as though he come back from the dead. And that's true. They will not believe anybody that come back from the dead because they, they'll dismiss any near death experience that you have, oh, that was just the drugs that you had, oh, that was just your brain cells dying. But hell is a real place. Hell is not a figment of anyone's imagination. There have been those who have had near death experiences who have gone there and have felt themselves burning. Case in point, there was a, a philosopher back in the 17th century called Voltaire. He said that Jesus was just a figment of our imagination and Jesus was uh, the project of a uh, a prostitute and a drunken Roman soldier. And before he died, he felt himself burning. Before he died, he felt it was, he was screaming in torment, saying, oh, the Nazarene, the Nazarene, oh, the Nazarene, make the Nazarene go away. So he was seeing something over there in the corner. And when he died, he said, thou conquerest over all, O Nazarene. And his, his, book, his uh, housekeeper said, I pray that I will never see another infidel die in my lifetime. All right. And we see that, what did Moses walk up on that hill with? He had a rod in his hand. Now this is just a common broom handle right here. But every shepherd in Israel had a staff such as this. But basically it wasn't anything that was all smooth and planed off and polished like this one right here. It was just basically an old tree trunk that they would break off and would have usually knocks on the end. But what King David and all the other shepherds did Whenever some, a, a wolf or a bear or a fox or whatever come into the, the hen house, they would use this staff here and they would bash the, the head end of the, uh, of the animal that was trying to attack their flock. They, would, they, 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 became, they became very good with these staffs. They even carried some of them into, into battle. And there's even a couple of them that are left uh, in museums that you get to see what they looked like. This staff was a, was a symbol of God's power, the power of God's word. I don't have uh, time to read you all the scriptures that I pulled, pulled up while I was studying, but uh, for example, Psalms 2, 1 through 2, verses 9, 11, and 12. It talks about, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall uh, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It starts off, it says that, he that setteth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. What was he talking about? The, king, the first two verses says that the kings of the earth uh, set, uh, set themselves and say the rulers take counsel together and say that they don't want the Lord amongst them. You see the same thing happen today. You see our politicians trying everything they can to trample underfoot. Uh, uh, everything that God built into us, trying to say, oh, that's politically incorrect. You can't be telling people how to live their lives, but yet they're trying to tell you how to live their lives too. See, they're hypocrites. They want us to shut up, but they want us to sit there and listen to all the garbage that they are trying to teach. Right, they want us right. to sit there and, uh, and, and, and uh, condone and rubber stamp everything that they try to do. And I have a hard time with Christians that say that they support these individuals, that sit down and say that uh, we should have the abortion on demand, that we should uh, allow same-sex marriage. I have a hard time with that. Well, you know that this is contrary to everything that God's word is. But at the bottom line, God is going to have the last laugh. Now we got this coronavirus that's going around here. Now everybody's running scared. 
Why is it that God always has to send some kind of pandemic or some kind of disaster where people start trying to want to go back to church again? Now the churches are full right now because everybody's scared that they're going to get the coronavirus. Everybody that sneezes, they're afraid that they're going to get coronavirus. But then when, uh, when it gets warm again, they said that the, uh, the centers of disease control said it'll probably die out when it starts getting warmer and warmer. Then people will go back their own merry way, and then they won't need God anymore. But God is still going to have the last laugh. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. The stone that Moses, uh, notice that it says that Moses, Aaron, and Hur stood up there on a stone. What did God say concerning stones? He said, he wasn't talking about Peter. A lot of uh, people say that he was talking about Peter and said, I will build my church, he says, upon uh, upon you, upon, upon Peter, I will build my church. He said, the name Peter is Petros. In the original Greek, meaning stone, a movable stone. But God said, upon Petra, or, or the uh, stone foundation, will I build my church. And the very gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He wasn't talking about building the church upon Peter, because Peter was going to die one day. Paul was going to die one day. John and all the apostles were going to die out one day. I'm going to die out one day. All these men that are sitting up here on this pulpit are going to die out one day. So he didn't build a church up on us. That's he right. built a church upon the stern foundation of his word, the stern foundation of his, of his law, the stern foundation of his judgment and his mercy. That is what the church is built upon. So he stood upon a rock that day, and, and, uh, and, he stood, and he lifted up his staff, the rod of power, and said, upon this church, I, upon this stone, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will, 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 will not prevail against it. Long as Moses held up his hands, the Israel prevailed. Whenever he dropped his hands, when he was getting tired, Israel failed. What is that saying to us today? Every time we lift up God's word in the body of Christ, the church is strong. Every time we let it drop, that's when chaos starts to take place. Came in case in point. We look around here on the news here and we see all this garbage that's going on right now. For well, last week they had a uh, drive-by shooting or had a running gun battle that was going on. There's a bunch of children that was hit by bullets. That means that we are letting God's hands droop. We see that they're passing laws saying that they should legalize marijuana. That they should, uh, there's some that want to even legalize the hard stuff, cocaine and all the rest of it. Let's just legalize drugs across the board, they say. Right down the street from this very church here, they got a head shop where you can go down there and buy marijuana and marijuana products if you want to. But why? Because it's legal. I don't care what they say is legal. That doesn't make it right. I don't care what they say is good. That does not make it right. What is good about legalizing marijuana? Do you want, uh, for, for example, a lot of you young people don't realize, when you get ready to go apply for a job, almost every job that you go for nowadays is going to make you take a drug test. And if you, even if they don't make you take a drug test before you are hired, you're going to take one, a random drug test uh, while you are employed. They do that on my job at Verizon. And when they did that the last time, about five or six years ago, we lost a whole lot of managers, lost a whole lot of co-workers, because they were showing up there on, on, on the job smoking, they had just got through smoking that stuff. They even caught a couple of them out there in the parking lot smoking that stuff. But now you, now you say, oh, it's legal, we can do it. Don't fool yourself. You're going you're gonna to be not only kicked out of the job that you have, but they go back and do a background check on you, you're going to be blacklisted all over town for any other job that you want. So when we see them up there legalizing drugs, we see Moses' hands going down. We see the hands going down. When we see them sitting down, passing off something that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ for another gospel. For example, what are you talking about? You go into most of these churches, they're telling you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is that you're supposed to always be healthy, supposed to always be wealthy, never going to have a problem, never going to have any unemployment, your parents ain't going to never die. I even heard a man on the radio saying that you yourself wouldn't die because you got the anointing 
I'm like, well, that's, uh, if that's the case, then my grandfather should still be alive today because he was a deacon. My father should still be alive. My grandmother should still be alive, but they are gone. Right. You, you didn't see anything in this word say anything about you going to live forever upon this earth because you have the anointing. You didn't see anything in this word that said that you was going to have everything that you want in this world because you become a Christian. That new car that I got sitting right out there in the front door there, if I should die right now, my nephews are going to be fighting over my sister and my mother and all of them. I said, okay, who did Uncle Lloyd leave the cruise to? Because I can't take it with me. <laughs> even, if, even if they bury me in it, they did that to a woman in California. It's a rich lady. She was uh, buried in a Volvo because she loved that car. I guarantee you that she is not driving that car around in heaven right now. <laughs> Out there at Forest Lawn Cemetery, there's a skeleton sitting behind a wheel of a brand new Volvo. You can't take it with you. That is another gospel. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is, the, what is it? We're letting the hands, of, of, uh, hands droop right now because we're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is Jesus, man was sinful and man needed to be redeemed. So God sent an antidote which was Jesus Christ. When we tell them, we lift in their hands up. We, we tell, we, when we tell that Jesus went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he said, repent, for the, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We lift up his hands. When we say that Jesus Christ was dead, he was buried, and he rose again from, from, for our justification and for our salvation and for our sanctification, we lift up his hands again. This is what the gospel of Jesus, when we say that Jesus Christ is coming back again, when we, say, when, we tell, uh, when we tell those that behold, uh, the heavens open, and there was a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he just judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, word is, his name is called the word of God. When we tell them about that, and tell them that Jesus Christ is coming back, and that Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom upon this earth. And that Jesus Christ is the only pathway to salvation. Come on now. We lift up his hands again. Now notice when Moses had to have somebody help him hold his hands up. Come, you stand, come up here. Right here. We lift up his hands. All right. Notice what you see right there. If you could see in your, uh, in your spiritual eye on the day that Jesus died, you would have seen the Holy Ghost and God the Father holding up his arms. You would have seen him lifting up his arms and said, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of the life freely. This is what we need to be doing. We need to hold up the arms of Jesus again. Hold up the arms of our pastor so that we'll be able to preach up the word. Hold up the arms of the ministers up here so that the word can go forth. And when we do this, when we do this, we honor God. We, we sanctify God in, in, in our community. And we will start to see change in our community. I don't care who they put in the White House. I don't care who they put in That's the White House. Right if you don't have Jesus Christ in the center of our society, we are lost. Thank you, gentlemen. Amen. It's all right. So I just tried in my limited vocabulary to let you all know that we need to lift Jesus up. Lift him up. That's good. We need to continue to lift him up. Don't ever let Moses' hands droop down. Because when we droop, let Moses' hands droop down, we fail. We fail miserably. We fail to do what God has told us to do. And you know what? God is going to hold that, us accountable for that. He says, if you tell not the man that, does, that, is, that he is going to die in his sins, he said, I will require it at your hands. Why are you so busy telling people, talking about they're going to get new cars and get new suits and all that kind of stuff, that they're going to die and leave behind here on this earth? And you're not telling them that they need something that is going to give them salvation and keep them from burning in hell for eternity. We fail. We fail miserably. That's all right. So once again, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up.
Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God for the word of God and the man of God.